We are live. Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens, Review and Thoughts. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, it is a time of great insecurity in Hollywood. Producers of blockbusters are extremely hesitant to greenlight anything that isn't connected to an already established franchise. So a movie trilogy is produced that will serve as sequels to movies that are no less than 32 years old by the time the first one is released, depicting Jedi, defenders of peace and justice in the galaxy. Whether you celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, Ramadan, Kwanzaa, anything else religious or anything non-religious, I wish you and the people you care about happy holidays. Confession time. And yeah, a couple of you already know because I mentioned it recently in a comment. I only now started watching the sequel trilogy and 2010's spin-off movies. I know, I know, you don't have to tell me, because I know. But in the year 2015, it wasn't that long ago since Lost ended and crushed my faith in J.J. Abrams as a filmmaker. Yes, I know he abandoned the show for other stuff, and no, I do blame Lindelof more, Damon Lindelof more than J.J., but J.J. helped create it, and then he didn't make sure to deliver a satisfying conclusion for fans. Let's be honest, when it comes to Lost, there's enough blame to go around. Okay, that is almost definitely the last negative thing I'm going to say about Lost in this video. In other words, I'm not going to talk more about Lost in this video. The thought of watching an entire trilogy of movies made by him, but today, all of the Star Wars movies are on Disney Plus to stream, so it wouldn't cost me more money than I was already paying for the streaming service, and from everything I've heard, Episode 8 does sound legitimately compelling, and isn't made by J.J. Abrams, so do the two spin-offs. You know, from the sound of it, it seemed like this movie might be fun, and Episode 9, nine sounds like an enjoyable, utter train wreck, so here we are. And I'm gonna mention it in this video as well, in case you don't see the noted, yeah, the other video I made about it. Originally, I wasn't expecting to review this movie until, like, weeks from now, I think three weeks from now, but Matrix 4 and Screen 5 were moved f in my cinema schedule since, you know, due to COVID restrictions. So, here we are. I don't hate fans of any of the Star Wars trilogies or the trilogies themselves, and I don't think that any of these fandoms are exclusively made up by people who hate people who do disagree with them or have other values than they do. If you express a viewpoint that, you know, disagrees with what I say in this video or any Star Wars video, I guess any video in general, the only thing I request is be respectful and I will be respectful in my reply. If you write something hateful towards me or towards anyone, most likely I'm just going to ignore you. Now, I have not... I, I, I haven't been carefully following the discussion about these more recent Star Wars movies until recently, so I don't know all the arguments in favor and against these movies. I, I did watch, like, videos I was... Like you know, midnight screening by uh, Brad Jones and his friends, and, like, just, yeah, various vi videos I was already, R Renegade Cut made a couple of videos about the new Star Wars movies, you know, but I wasn't, like, watching everything that talked about it. I have watched a bunch of those recently, but given that there's been years for this stuff to build up, I, you know, it's difficult for me to watch all of it. I'm gonna try to avoid saying the however often true statement. It's true that this is a flaw of this movie, however it was also a flaw in the original trilogy. After all, two wrongs don't make a right. Enough wrongs do make a ladder, but that's not really particularly relevant to the conversation. Now, instead of me simply restating here what he did a great job of saying for going into criticisms of the character of Ray and other common criticisms, I will direct you to the videos made by Cosmonaut Variety Hour on this movie. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. 
Also, if you're only interested in the review itself, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch. So I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. Now, I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise. Not ones released later, but set earlier. Only ones released earlier. But as soon as I end the review itself, please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this film, including discussing the ending. Now, so, so yeah, if you're just joining, you know, I've been, I started a couple of months ago by now, by, you know, I've, I'm reviewing every single of the main Star Wars movies. I, I don't know 100% about the Clone Wars. I mean, at some point, I probably will do those movies and that show, but my back's going to have to recover before I start on any long-running series and let's see but but yeah I started you know doing those and I'm doing all of the main ones and I'm doing them in the order that they were released in so I have already reviewed A New Hope but I'm only getting the, the you know Rogue One will be the next one I review even though that one is set before A New Hope so this movie is a soft reboot. I try to grade any soft reboot on a curve, and the reason why is I like not being miserable, which is what I will be if I focus on all the ways that the original, like, oh, it did it first, or it did this or that better, or, you know. Is any soft reboot as good as the one or multiple movies that it is a soft reboot of? Probably not. If it exists, then I don't know of it. It's a soft reboot because they figure that it's a better way to ensure, you know, that's a better way to ensure making a lot of money off it. But that doesn't have to mean that it's automatically bad. Hence, grading on a curve. I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers, and I always, almost never let any issues I might have interfere with my review and analysis. Like, I already mentioned, you know, I used to think the world of J.J. Abrams. I have now recovered from the disappointment I felt when Lost ended and it ended the way that it did I'm not I, I don't think that he's like the best filmmaker ever but I don't like it's fine you know I'm, I'm not I am no longer like really upset with with him and the way he makes movies. I try to just approach it as well, some things he does well, some things he doesn't do as well. And that's, you know, I'm I'm going to try to be as objective as I can. This movie did not ruin my life or my childhood, etc. Now there are several major appeals of this kind of movie. One of them is they can have many wild concepts, have them play off each other. Magic power versus robots, for example. And, yeah, I would say there's, like, it does manage to pack multiple really fun ideas into, and have them play off each other, yeah. And... Another major appeal with their wild concepts, they can give compelling commentary on real issues with greater efficiency than, let's say, a regular drama, for example. And, yeah, I would say, like, the... I guess that's technically a spoiler, so I'm not going to give details. I will just say that there are relationships in this movie that... Yeah, that, w that they use to comment on real-life stuff. And they do quite a good job of it. Mm. I think I will just very briefly say, I think the movie was basically fine. Like, 
I love A New Hope. I've never really wanted a soft reboot of A New Hope, but I, I do think the movie, the movie definitely does do some things that are interesting and then make it worth existing. It's not just, like, the same thing. It does some things differently in ways that help comment on the original. And, you know, there's... Uh, yeah, yeah, some people have said that, like, watching these new movies made them no longer like the original trilogy. That's not the way I feel right now. I doubt it's going to be the way I feel, you know, after having watched the other ones. That's not usually the way I react to seeing, like, I've, I've seen a lot of bad sequels, but the originals, I, I can still really get into. But, but yeah, like, I would have liked the movie to be even more different, which is one of the reasons, like, I'm, I'm very psyched for both Rogue One and Episode Eight, The Last Jedi, because it seems like those really take some chances, really go in in directions that you know I, I i feel like why are we why are we making a seventh star wars movie if we're not going to do something interesting with it you know like the the original trilogy was interesting and that was why like george lucas didn't just make it because oh you know this one's okay well th he maybe made some decisions in especially return of the jedi that helped sell toys but he didn't make them just to sell toys. He didn't make them just to appeal to people. You know, he made it because he thought this was something interesting to do. The original trilogy was something we hadn't seen before. You know, before... Like, people forget this, but before A New Hope, your movie would either be good or it would... Uh, like, ah, uh, wait. No, ah. Uh, Movies with a lot, yeah, especially right, special effects were just not that convincing, and uh, like the the some some of them were kind of cool, but it wasn't like you didn't sit down to watch a movie and were like, wow, that looks real, and you know, George Lucas and ILM changed that, and he also made it that a, you know, a, a movie with a lot of special effects was still a good movie, because that was another thing. Back then, if your movie had a lot of special effects, that was, that was it, that was the movie, you know, oh, come see your special effects. It wasn't, come see your movie, which is good, and has special effects. You can't just make, you can't just make the same thing as the original trilogy in, you know, th this movie came out in 2015. You can't, just put out the same thing and think that that's anything interesting. Like, to, I mean, at that point, just re-release the original, you know. Actually, yeah, tell you what, re-release the originals without any of the special edition BS, and, you know, that'll get butts and seats. But, no, they, they realized we have to do something interesting here, and so they did. And I really... It, it, this movie would have been just incredibly boring if it was just the same but they realized that there was you know there were interesting things to do and I don't personally think again you know maybe maybe the last Jedi will feel disrespectful to Star Wars to me I know it did to a lot of people I don't think it will to me but this movie did not feel disrespectful to Star Wars to me, and I know some people have felt that, and I understand what they, where they're coming from, but I do disagree, and I might talk about some of that in in the spoiler section, but it's usually spoilers. Then yeah. Now, personally, I think it's fine for like, I don't think you have to be like. A really big fan of Star Wars in order to be like allowed to criticize <sighs> yeah criticize Star Wars or talk a lot about Star Wars you know movies or or the like but 
yeah, some some people do find that very important. So, yeah, here's, you know, I've I've watched episodes one through now seven, and I'll just very briefly give my my ratings. So, yeah, episodes four and five, ten out of ten. Episode six is a six out of ten. All three of the prequels are five out of ten to me. This one is a 7 out of 10. And... So... Right, so... Content warning and or trigger warning. The movie features some of the following, and I'm going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering content. Torture, kidnapping, ableism, Gaslighting, murder, uh, see, genocide, and fictitious Nazis. Let's see the right. The movie is rated PG thirteen. So is this video. And, yeah, this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from this movie, in another tab. I won't mind. And, yeah, so, as mentioned, I streamed this. I didn't have to pay anything extra to watch it. So anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing, earlier movies in the franchise, stuff made by the same film filmmakers. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this video are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So in a number of ways, this movie is like the original trilogy, especially A New Hope. So I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they're different from one another. So I'm not just repeating myself. Now, in order to follow this movie's plot, you will need to have watched episodes 4 through 6. You don't need to have watched episodes 1 through 3. And, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that that was... Yeah, it was, it, this movie was going to have to be completely different if you were supposed to be able to follow it without having watched episodes 4 through 6. But I think the movie does do a good job of building on what we, what we saw in those movies and analyzing and commenting on some of what we saw in those movies. Again, from, from a fan's perspective, not from the perspective of someone who thinks that the original trilogy is bad. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video is possible that I will touch my face like I just did. I want to assure you I washed my hands carefully since the last time I was outside and will wash my hands again before going out. Now, the so yeah, this is my very first viewing watching it, you know, I, it, after, I, I haven't done very much since watching it, so it is fresh in my mind. I recorded two other videos and had lunch, but other than that, it's, you know, I, other than that, I just got done watching it, so. Plot. 32 years after episode 6, there is a new evil galactic empire, a new Death Star, a new young person that you could see might develop into a Jedi Knight, an incredible pilot who fights for the rebels, a new Darth Vader, several actors returning, places and technology that are very similar to what we saw in the original trilogy, and seriously, honestly, pinky promise, we there, there's no Jar Jar Gungans at all, we won't talk about midi chlorians. Please, please, please watch our movie. Seriously, though, the movie does have a lot to offer. 
and a lot of the similarities are not as big retreads as they might appear at first. Now, I'm not going to point out every single aspect of this movie that is like the original trilogy, whether as a positive or as a negative. I will talk about some specific ones that I think are especially good or bad, but this video is not just going to be me comparing it to the original trilogy. There are other people who have watched those, you know, yeah, uh, it's, I, yeah, I will just briefly say, I have watched the the three movies of the original trilogy dozens of times, but I'm sure there are people who are who've watched them even more times who have done like videos pointing out every single thing in this one that is like those. So honestly, the first time I heard it, I was like, J.J. Abrams doing Star Wars? I mean, I love Alias, and certainly there are some good things about Lost that survived that terrible finale. I just don't know that he's a good fit. Oh, wait, he named the new Death Star Star Killer, the name that was originally going to be Luke Skywalker's last name, a fact that you could not learn by just watching the movies, but you would have to actually have done your research to know, okay, he's a super fan, or failing that, listens to their input, I'm in. That was another thing about Lost. I'm pretty sure that was the last one, though. Now, let's see the, since I will be criticizing certain aspects of the movie, I want to put my cards on the table here. I'm, I'm progressive. I try to empathize with everyone, though if you're causing harm, you know, you need to stop or be stopped, including if that means that the only way to stop your violence is for someone to get physical, as long as they don't go any further than absolutely necessary. So, it's really great that when they cast this movie, wrote and cast this movie, you know, some of the genders and races, you know, the, the, yeah, the, the, Original characters in this are there. There are, yeah. One of, one of our leads is a woman. Another one of our leads is a black man. You know, when the original trilogy was made, there was an expectation that the good guys were white and largely male. And you know, today we celebrate the diversity found in real life. And, yeah, it's, it's pretty terrible that I even have to say the following, but some people, I don't know if there's very many people left who still haven't watched this movie, but just putting it out there, yeah, some people won't watch this if they aren't assured of the following. Not every straight white cis man in this film is depicted, depicted as being evil, inferior, etc., there are major characters that fall into those categories. And yes, some of the straight white cis men in this movie are depicted as evil. And before I start talking details about the technical aspects, let me start by saying the people are very talented. I'm not calling into question anyone's skill or enthusiasm. So, writing. This was written by Let's see. Lawrence Kasdan, Jeremy A. Uh, JJ Abrams, and Michael Arndt, if that's how you pronounce his name. It's a really great sign that they brought back Lawrence Kasdan. And yeah, he apparently also helped write Solo. So yeah. You know, for for those who might not know, he Lawrence Kasdan helped write episodes five and six, and a lot of like he's. I've I've heard that a lot of the best elements of Empire Strikes Back, he wrote. Those those were his idea, and he fought to make sure they stayed. And yeah, and so yeah, 
JJ, he returned to direct episode 9, which I'm not going to talk very much about that before I actually get to the video where I, yeah, the entire video where I specifically talk about that movie. But yeah, other than these two Star Wars movies, yeah, you know, Lost and Alias, Mission Impossible 3, oh yeah, he wrote Joyride, yes, he also wrote Armageddon, and Gone Fishing, Fishing. I don't remember if Forever Young was a good movie or a bad movie, but anyway, he he does some great writing for, for this as he did for Lost, Mission Impossible 3, and Alias. And Joyride was perfectly serviceable. It was it was fine for what it was. Now, Michael Arndt, apparently, like he's he's still credited as a writer, but apparently, like he wrote, like I forget if he was he had finished an entire draft or how long he got, but but he was like it's gonna take so and so long to, to finish and that wasn't you know that was more time than Disney was willing to to wait so they basically took him off it which like he also wrote Hunger Games Catching Fire so yeah it now I 100% understand why some fans are frustrated that the expanded universe is no longer canon according to this movie. They spent a lot of hours diving deep into the expanded universe. With all due respect, I think it was necessary to disregard the expanded universe. You can't expect casual viewers to know all of that lore. And yeah, you know, they, they, yeah. So I have watched most of the things that J.J. Abrams has written. I followed him from his TV career into his blockbuster filmmaking. So I'm going to briefly look at his strengths and how they translate to the big screen. I don't think that his focus on mystery stories, the mystery box that he likes to talk about, translates well to Star Wars. And for sure a lot of his best work is in the pilot episode of the first, you know, or the first couple of hours of a story that he is telling where he can really grab your attention with slick production, ridiculously contrived plots, highly emotional situations, both really dark and really funny in the same episode or film, that kind of thing. He excels at setting up scenarios and such that you want to see play out. So it makes a lot of sense to get him to start a new trilogy. You don't really want him to do a one-off movie as much as a series. He has done a better job at going from TV to big screen than some others, you know, his grasp of big bluster, big <laughs> bluster, yeah, some big blockbuster visuals is far stronger than, say, Joss Whedon. He tends to introduce too many ideas for all of them to be satisfyingly explored and do justice to. And, yeah, you know, when I record this video, I haven't yet watched episodes 8 and 9, but I'm not surprised that they don't manage to deliver on all of the ideas that he set up here. Same thing happened on Alias, same thing happened on Lost. Yes, I keep mentioning Lost. I think that might have been the last one. Now, I've seen some say that since the prequels over-explain a number of things, you know, we're always being told something in those movies, that means that it's fine for this movie to, you know, all, to, to have things that seem like they need to be explained and not explain them, at least in this movie. I disagree, and I would say it's something that J.J. relies entirely too much on, not, not that people say that about, but this idea that you can start something, you know, there's a, there's a really good video by College Humor. I want to say it's called God, Damon Lindelof is Annoying, and maybe it is more of a Lindelof thing, but it is, uh, yeah, J.J. does it in this movie, and I'm, I don't think Damon Lindelof had anything to do with this movie. And, you know, in that they point out that it's not that we're invested as much as we feel like something's missing. Like we're we're like, okay, but 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 you you need to tell me this. It's it's you know and yeah, I, I don't 
yeah, um, to, I'm, I'm going back to my prepared notes. On making something mysterious so that he can have something that would be hard to explain without having to explain it. Hard to explain without having to explain it. There we go. And hoping that the mystery is enough to make us care. I find it a frustrating trait. I forget exactly who said it. It might be more than one person, but Star Wars is not a mystery. It's not supposed to be a mystery. And I think some of what he brings to this, I, I think in some ways this is better than it would be without his traits, but I don't think that the, the stuff that's barely explained and the kind of mysteries, I don't think that those are really particular, that, that those make the, the movie better. <clears throat> now a lot of people had a negative reaction to episodes one, th one, two, three, and would much rather have had something that was more similar to episodes four, five, and six. And because of that, there are a number of people who say that you can't criticize this movie for being so much like episode four. I personally think there's a there's a healthy medium between yeah episode seven and episodes one through three. I I don't think it makes sense to say that just because people didn't like episodes one through one the prequels and talked about that they missed the original trilogy that means that you can't criticize this movie because of how similar it, I I don't really think that logic checks out. And, and let's keep in mind that some of the people who criticize the, the sequel trilogy, they, you know, yeah, some of them like the prequels fine and don't think that the prequels needed to be closer to, like, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's an excuse and it's going to mean that we get less creativity in, you know, you're... you're you're giving them an out, you know, the, the next time they, it's, it's, I, I feel like it's more likely to lead to less creativity within movies, and I, I really think that's too bad. I, I already mentioned that I don't particularly like the prequels, I don't think they turn out to be particularly good movies, but I, I respect that they tried to do something different than the original trilogy, and I would say that overall I was more entertained by this movie. I, I would say the... I believe the word is metatextual. The metatextuality of this movie, the, the way it comments on the original trilogy, that I found interesting. But other than that, I don't know that... Other than that, I would say that the prequels I found more interesting when when you look at like ideas and how different they are you know that the idea that the prequels are very different from the original trilogy I think it makes a lot of sense to be frustrated by that because you know people showed up in droves to watch those movies because of you know the the love for, for the original trilogy but sometimes, like, the original reaction, not, not everybody liked Empire Strikes Back at first. You know, and now it's considered to be the best one. So sometimes art is about, or creative expression, sometimes creative expression isn't about giving us what we want or what we think we want. It's about giving us what we need. And, yeah, the prequels, they had some interesting stuff and and just because they're very different that's not automatic i mean if if george lucas ever said if you love the original trilogy you'll love the prequels if he ever said that then i haven't heard it i i don't know of that the as, as far as i he he wanted he wanted to make something that was different you know like i said earlier in this video Otherwise, why bother? If you're just going to make more of the same thing, like, you have... It's easy to get your hands on copies of the original trilogy. If you just want the original trilogy, just go watch those, you know. I don't think the, the prequels were bad 
because they were different from the original trilogy, though that obviously led to some frustration. And I, d I don't think that it's automatically a good thing that this movie is very similar to the original trilogy, especially New Hope. But yeah, for sure, like, I'm hoping that episode 8 will will go deeper into interesting ideas than, than this one did. But, you know, I've, I've seen some say that, you know, it, this movie didn't take very many chances because they had to prove to people that they were capable of making something that would be recognized by fans as a good Star Wars movie. And I think that's very true. I, th I think they really... It, in part, it is course correcting because the prequels were so different. And it's also just these are completely new people. You know, George Lucas basically had nothing to do with this movie. He gave, you know, he, he sold the rights and he let other people, you know, make Star Wars movies. And when you have that kind of situation, you the new people are, got, are going to have to prove themselves as being capable of doing Star Wars well. Now, let's see... Yeah, so, you know, some people found the the evil galactic empire of the original trilogy to be too subtly Nazi, you know, for, for some people. So here, it's made completely explicit. Like, you, it is impossible to watch this movie and not realize, oh, these are Nazis. These are space Nazis. Now, let's see. Yeah, so in October 2012, uh, George Lucas sold Lucasfilm to Disney. And he said, I always said I wasn't going to do any more. And that's true, because I'm not going to do any more. But that doesn't mean I'm unwilling to turn it over to Kathy, Kathleen Kennedy, president of Disney, to do more. And, right, he, yeah, he was creative consultant on the film attended early story meetings, advised on the details, but, let's see, yeah, you know, and he, he gave, he turned over material, like, rough story treatments for episodes 8 through 9, 7 through 9, rather, and, let's see, yeah, and, and, you know, he later said Disney discarded those ideas. Although I feel like at least some of it I read I read that at least some of it was put into on the tip of my tongue, episode eight. Now Right. Aren't worked on the script for eight months but said he needed eighteen more, which was more time than Disney or Abrams could give him. And, yeah, as soon as he left Kazdan and Abrams, took over script duties. And, yeah, and six weeks later, the first draft was completed. Abrams said the key to the film was return to the roots of the first Star Wars film and to be based more on emotion than explanation. Now, so yeah, quoting a few fellow critics here, a generic half-baked script, and masterful storytelling in that it seems to be taking its time, but is always moving relentlessly forward and coming up with surprises. We don't know enough about, you know, good guys and bad guys, and how big and powerful they are compared to each other after episode six and you know there's the opening crawl says that the new republic work with the resistance and 
it, you know, the, that's the thing. Like, if if there is a new republic, why is a resistance needed? Like, a resistance, that's if you don't have a government that you can, you know, if, if the government that there is, it, yeah, either either there is no actual government or the government that there is will not listen to, like, regular, you know, people that is, for example, if it's fascistic. And, yeah, it's like, why... why is is the Republic doing anything at all about the First Order? If not, why not? If they are, why can't we tell that they are? Like, if this movie had simply, if, if the opening crawl had simply said the New Republic, like the old one before it has fallen, you know, then be like, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, we'd still need an explanation, because the and it's the kind of thing that's either going to bother you about this movie, or you're just gonna roll with it, because at the end of the day, it like episode six basically said the evil galactic empire is no more like the leaders of it are all dead and the the most the the strongest of their forces have been defeated they don't have any like both of the death stars have been destroyed by the end of episode six there's you know yeah I'm on the record as saying that Star Wars doesn't need to explain everything. I like that there are a number of things that we just have to guess or accept. But this is something that really does need explaining, and the explanation needs to be in the movie. I know some people are going to say, oh, but, you know, you got to read th this and this, you know, or it's it's in a deleted scene or something. But no, it, it needs to be in the movie. It really... Now... Episode 6 gives us a happy ending, and this movie takes away some of that happy ending. And some people consider it a, a good idea, some people think it's a betrayal of fans. I appreciate that this movie takes some chances, and, you know, there's a there's a phrase that I, 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 th I think is really applicable here. Happy endings... Are stories that haven't finished yet. I think it would be very boring to do more movies but let the characters from the original trilogy retain their happy endings. Now I'm not gonna go into... I'm, I'm not gonna spoil anything in this part of the video but you know like just by virtue of the fact that there still needs to be you know it's no longer the Rebel Alliance it's the Resistance and it's no it's not the evil galactic empire it's the first order but you know they fought really hard and they lost you know a, a number of people died fighting to stop these fascists and now there are more fascists so i i don't think that it's automatically good to undo a happy ending but i do think i i I don't think that that you could have made a new Star Wars episode movie without I I mean yeah like either like it would it would either have to be prequels to the prequels or sequels to the original trilogy that do undo the 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 happy ending Other, otherwise you really can't the they're just I'm I'm not saying you can't have conflict in Star Wars. Some I you know some some of the games set after episode 6 do a really great job at having yeah, but the the I th I I said when I talked about the prequels that an argument could be made that it's not a Star Wars episode movie if it doesn't have you know a, a small group of rebels 
fighting against the, the space fascists. And yeah, I I I I don't I don't I don't know how you really do that. I'm I'm not saying this movie needed as many references to the original trilogy as it does have, but I don't think like it's it's also, you know, well it's it's one thing that this movie is so much closer to the original trilogy than the prequels are. I think it would have been very strange of a decision. I'm I'm not trying to offend anyone who does think it's a good idea, but I like hypothetically, let's say that they made episode 7 and it was more similar to episode 1 than episode 4. I mean, how do you how do you get that just feels cuz like just off the top of my head, the the I guess technically that is yeah. I'll I'll stick with like in the prequels there isn't currently fascism, but we you know if you watch the prequels after you watch the originals you know that by the end of of episode three there's going to be, you know the the fascism is going to to have started you know or or start soon i i don't know how you would make something that was i i i think it could be interesting you know maybe there'll be a disney plus show that will depict you know what happened soon after episode six right after the evil galactic empire has fallen you know, I there's still some interesting challenges. You still have to rebuild democracy, you know. Now, the movie has a lot. This movie has a lot of coincidences. And these coincidences mean that the movie can move fast. And it's kind of the th like some people consider it to be an issue. Other people think that... You know, it's it's fine. Once you see it, you can't unsee it, and yeah, like either it's gonna bother you or you're just gonna go with it because it allows the movie to do a lot of things that we saw in the original trilogy, and obviously the movie really wants to appeal to nostalgia. I went into the movie th basically feeling like you know what, whatever it has coincidences, I'm just gonna go with it. After a while, it did kind of get grating to me. Like, it it wouldn't be difficult to remove at least a bunch of them without the movie being that much slower or having that many less, you know, nostalgic references and such. So plot twists. Overall, I'd say the, the movie handles them well. They tend to be pretty decently thought out and interesting. I don't think there are too few of them. I guess an argument can be made that some of them you can maybe figure out, but it's also like I'm not sure how you would go into this movie. I mean, yeah, I already mentioned it's... You should not watch this movie if you haven't already watched episodes 4 through 6. It's fine if you haven't watched episodes 1 through 3, but if you make this the first Star Wars movie you watch, you are going to be confused. And... Yeah, the... the given that like the moment that the moment that the marketing showed some characters and didn't didn't tell us exactly who they are but just showed us characters and we know it's a sequel to episode 6 people start theorizing and you know not all of the like some people did manage to guess what the actual like uh, what this movie did with some of those characters as far as their relationship with uh, 
legacy characters. You know, ones that have appeared in other Star Wars movies before this one. I would I would say overall it does a pretty good job with with twists yes. So the direction handled by J J Abrams so I haven't watched Super Eight I haven't watched his two Star Trek movies but yeah actually that does leave yeah I've watched two of the movies he's directed but yeah this and Mission Impossible three. The movie is filmed and edited the way that action movies from this same time, like, you know, if you, whether you watch this movie or you watch other action movies from 2015, yeah, the filming and editing, you know, that's, that's the way action movies are done today. And that helps make sure that the movie doesn't feel as much, you know, it, there, there are a number of, similarities between this movie and A New Hope and the the fact that it's filmed and edited differently helps to to make it feel yeah less like just a retread now among the many many problems of the prequel trilogy is that it didn't really feel like movies made in the late 90s and early to mid 2000s so many things about them were stuck in George Lucas's youth, and if this movie is anything, it is determined to avoid being like the prequels. It's more emotionally complex, more layered. I'm not saying that the original trilogy, especially A New Hope, was trying to be that and failing. I'm saying you can't do A New Hope today without that, and they wisely realized that and addressed it. It really, like... Part of the point of A New Hope was to do something different. Like, today everybody knows Star Wars, but before Star Wars, nothing looked, sounded like Star Wars. No, nothing had those kinds of special effects. No other worlds looked quite like it. You know, if you go back, like, some of these movies made about, like, space travel, space battles and such, they are, they do not really, yeah. And, and George Lucas wanted to change that, and he did. I think it would be very disappointing to make a Star Wars movie that didn't change anything. And, yeah, here they, I'm, I don't think that every movie today has to be like, I, th I think you could probably still make some fairly straightforward, minimalist kind of... Not not saying Star Wars was minimalist, but... Yeah, I, th I think you could do that today, but I don't think... I don't think you could make a movie this similar to A New Hope and still have it be that. Now, this movie has almost no lens flares, which... I... I feel like that's I've I've heard that he goes absolutely wild with those in his Star Trek movies. I haven't watched those. I'm not currently planning on on doing so. Like I'm not I'm not the world's biggest fan of Star Trek. I do really love Deep Space 9. But I really don't like this thing of like I have a list a relatively short list, but I don't think I'm not going to go into it here. But I, I, there are there are things about his movies that I've heard, his two Star Trek movies that I've heard are the case, and it bothers me. And I'm, yeah, I, I don't think. Now, okay, I will just very briefly say. I don't think it is a bad thing that the two movies he made look good, which not every Star Trek, like, some of them do look good, but Star Trek wasn't really something you turned to for, yeah, sci-fi that looked good. It was for, for more cerebral sci-fi, and 
I don't think that it has to... There are a lot of Star Trek stories. People forget this, but if you watch, like, the various shows, there are a bunch of them where it is just, oh, this this is a fun adventure, and, yeah, like, it, it kind of challenges your way of thinking and this or that, but it's still an adventure story. You know, it's not... They're, they're not sitting in a lab analyzing for 90% for of it, and I, I do think that it was... I, I think Star Trek needed that. I think Star Trek needed for for like the average viewer to see Star Trek can look good, can sound good. Because it is it is a, a very like if if you try today to dig into Star Trek, you basically kind of need like a um an ep a, a guide of what episodes to watch and which ones you can just skip because if you just sit down and just put on the the first several episodes, it's, you know, I mean, you actually, I'm not sure you can jump into any of them. I uh, maybe maybe Enterprise, but uh, don't. It's terrible. I don't think you can jump into any of them without having watched the ones that came before, and that's that's a tall order. For um, yeah, and and yeah, like I. If you just sit down, you watch the first three or five of the original Shatner episodes. Like, if you if you don't have an emotional investment, you know, I, I was introduced to Star Trek by my ex fiance, and she had a huge emotional investment. So as we were watching, I was like, "Oh, she's super into this. That's that's good. I, you know, it's something we can share." But if you just try to get into it without sharing it with someone who already loves it and and a lot of the people who, who love it you know they were just like they were kids when they first watched it and it was it was on maybe their parents watched it and it was something they could share you know but if you just sit and try to get into it without any of that it's a uh, it's some of it is really good some of it is is excellent science fiction but it's it's a uh, it's a lot to ask of someone today to, to try to get into all of it. And that's one of the things, like, if you if you just watch the 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 Star Trek movies that JJ did and I don't know, maybe also the new some of the new shows. I I, I haven't watched any Star Trek since Enterprise and I, I don't know that I ever will. But apparently, you know, for some of them you can get into them without having watched all of this other earlier Star Trek and I do think that is a good idea I think it is if, if Star Trek is to have any chance of surviving it really needs to become a little bit more flexible with that kind of thing now let's see the Um, okay, I am skimming through. I copied down a lot of stuff for the direction. Right, so according to Wikipedia, several directors were considered, including David Fincher, Brad Bird, John Favreau, and Guillermo del Toro. And, right, and Steven Spielberg suggested Kathleen Kennedy to J.J. Suggested J.J. Abrams to Kathleen Kennedy. I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of interested in what Star Wars under David Fincher or Guillermo del Toro looks like. I'm not that familiar with Brad Bird. I only watched the... He did a, he did a Mission, Impossible, Mission Impossible 4. And I hear good things about the Incredibles movies, and I think they might be on at Disney Plus, so I probably will end up watching them. They're they're comic book based. I'm not I'm not made of stone. I love comic book adaptations. John Favreau, that makes a lot of sense, and he did go on to do the you know some of the Mandalorians. So yeah. 
I am more, I'm, I'm glad that he went on to do The Mandalorian. I'm more interested, you know, I, I will, I'm not 100% certain right now exactly when I'll get to Mandalorian, but it is, I am going to do it. One of my subscribers, Arts Cafe, requested that I do it, and I, I don't really have any, you know, it, it seems legitimately like a fun show. But, um... I th it seems more of the kind of thing that John Favreau than than just a straight Star Wars movie is because you know yeah it's not a, it's not a spoiler to say they're they're not Star Wars episodes movies yeah the episodes of that show are not like the movies called episodes they're more like stories set in the Star Wars galaxy, and that makes a lot of sense. I think that is probably the way for them to to go. Right, I've seen some people say that the movie, th this movie is like half a Star Wars movie and half a J.J. Abrams film. That does make a lot of sense. There's definitely things in this that are way more J.J. than their Star Wars. And one critic said that, you know, the first time you watch the movie, you really like it, but the more times you watch it, the less you like it. There's not really anything in this movie that you don't get out of it the very first time you watch it. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I could definitely imagine that. I'm not, I, I don't think I'm going to be watching it again anytime soon. So, the opening. The opening crawl in the first few scenes do a really good job of establishing the stakes and getting you immediately deeply invested you know I, I would say the the opening yeah the the opening crawl is better than several possibly all three of the prequel opening crawls I would argue the opening scenes of two and three are also quite good not as good as this but you know they're they're yeah but the opening, the, the stormtroopers are made to look dangerous and scary again like they were at the start of A New Hope and were not by the end of Return of the Jedi. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. And I would say the, the ending of the movie, there's definitely some interesting things that it does. There's also some frustrating things that it does. It doesn't rely on Deus Ex Machina, but the writing continues to be convenient. Like, the writing is convenient from the very first scene. It's, it's, if, if convenient writing really bothers you, this is, this movie is really going to get under your skin. I, like I said, I tried to, to not think too much about it. Because it can't really bother me. Now, I, I would say some of this movie kind of lost my interest. I guess at least the middle third, honestly, probably, probably the last two thirds. Like after a while, I realized something fairly devastating about the movie, and the movie, the rest of the movie went on to prove that I had, I, yeah, I, I did indeed, I, I was right about what I figured for the rest of it, and that's, yeah. I forget if, I'm, I'm not sure I've already said, so I will briefly say, the, the movie does do a pretty good job nostalgia baiting, at times it gets kind of aggressive, and it's like, okay, okay, calm, calm down, we already paid for the tickets. You have our attention. You know it's fine, but yeah, for for sure, like you know, earlier in the video I joked, oh, the movie's like thirty-two years old. That does also mean that there are some people who've been watching it over and over for thirty-two years and really badly want a new one, and then this comes along and says, you know, remember this, remember this, and just yeah. You know, it it does, a lot of the time it does do a good job with that. 
and the the fan service can be quite good and and again like the movie I wouldn't say the movie ever really just feels like okay then this thing happened because you know it's that's the way it is in the original trilogy and we have to do that there there's always the there's always some twist on it and it and it doesn't feel like it's just a twist to have a twist there's you know they they do different things and yeah the the uh, some things about the ending the the climax there are some things there that are a bit like okay this is basically here because you know, it was there in the in the original trilogy. People expect it to be there. That's how it feels. That's not exactly how it is, but you know, as yeah. But no, the the movie does do a good job. Like the the um, I'm not going to talk very much about Prometheus here, but. Film Brain does a really great job, you know, really getting into all the flaws of that movie. But one of the things he says is that it feels like you're watching the original Alien, but like the scenes are on shuffle mode or something. You know, and I would say that's true. When you watch that movie, that is that's that's how it feels to me as well. Not not to everyone. But it's how it feels to me as well. That's not the way this movie feels, and it very easily could have. I I kind of did fear that this movie would just feel like oh, just you know they changed a little bit. But now, let's see some so so yeah onto the characters. Some of these characters you don't get that much information about, but the leads. Some of the some of the really important information about them you only find out fairly late in the film, but it is in there. You know, the, it it wasn't like at later explained in an interview. It's not a deleted scene. It's not in a sequel. It is in there. The, the the main characters in this movie do have significant definition and they're not the same as the ones of the original trilogy you know I've I've seen people say oh well this character is basically the same as this and you know I'll, I'll, I'll address a few of those where as I talk about the individual characters but it's it's not the the case here and the the legacy ones are not in the exact same place they were the last time and the you know stuff has happened in between that helps inform who they are now I let's see some people will definitely find that, or have definitely found that some of these characters are not, like, not the most appealing. Certainly the, the new villain is, uh, villains, the new villains are kind of love it or hate it characters. Like, you're, I'm not, it's, it's difficult to find a middle ground because they are very, pronounced they don't they don't really tone it down they are these very specific characters and character types and such and uh, yeah the movie inspires empathy for some of the characters now there's definitely some comic relief going on with some of the characters and some people do you feel that okay that's just that's an annoying character the film goes too far to get laughs out of them now let's see. 
I guess the is that I don't think yeah I'm not gonna say exactly who plays him but our new villain our new main villain is Kylo Ren so you know we have some returning characters at least one that's an oldie but a goodie we also have a new baddie and he has a really cool bad guy voice and yeah and the um, I guess I can't say that much about it without spoiling I'll just say that some people find him very frustrating and annoying I find him quite compelling I he's one of the most interesting aspects of this entire movie I would say and Daisy Ridley plays Ray, a scavenger and you know some people say it's they, they just gender swap Luke Skywalker but if you actually look at like she has in a lot of ways she's a different character it's it's only like sure if you just look at the the like very superficially it does look she does look like a Luke now I'm not gonna get into whether or not the character is a Mary Sue I don't think it's a particularly interesting conversation I can't help but notice how frequently this criticism is used against female characters but not male ones including when like there are a number of male characters that are this kind of I guess the term is Gary Stu, but they're less likely to get called out. If you personally believe that Ray is a character for whom certain positive things happen too easily, but if you're open to the idea that you might be incorrect about that, I recommend the video made by Sean with a U called The Truth About the Truth About Star Wars The Force Awakens, although I must warn you, you will be subjected to clips of Stephen Molyneux. And it, the, the video does spoil this entire movie also, but yeah. And CinemaWins in his Everything Great About video also defends some things and so does the IMDb Frequently Asked Questions. Now... And, and quoting a few of my fellow critics here, you learn everything you need to know about her character in the first few minutes of her screen time. Very true. And that is like she has one of the best character introductions in this movie like you immediately you really it's and it's 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 showing it's show don't tell they they do a really good job of getting across all of this very important information about her character and yeah like they they and let's see. Right, and another of my fellow critics said that it's true that Rey is a strong character, but all Star Wars main characters are. And for some reason, it only seems to bother people that she is strong. It would be a problem that she's so strong if the movie didn't have tension. If there was no danger, but there's plenty of it. Now, J.J. Abrams likes doing stories where young women are strong and very frequently also good role models for other young women. You know, Alias, Kate on Lost, some of the characters in Mission Impossible 3. I'm not, I can't go too much into it without spoiling some of that movie, but. I'll, I'll consider that. If I do, I'll, I'll do the finger thing. Probably ones in the Star Trek movies and on Felicity. I haven't watched those. But yeah, these are women who can take part in action scenes. They're smart. They're not scared. They're not defined purely uh, by, uh, by their emotions. They're not obsessed about... Uh, set, uh, yeah, uh, obsessing about marriage having children, th these kinds of 
negative, frequently negative stereotypes for women. I'm, I'm not saying it's it's a bad thing to want those things, but in movies and TV, it's very frequently made out to be a, a bad thing. And JJ is good at making it feel earned, making it make sense. These are not women who wake up one day and suddenly they're just incredible at this. No, they work hard. You know, the, the female spies in his stories, usually they've spent a lot of time, energy, and other resources, really pushed themselves to become such good spies. You know, fighting is one thing, ability, you know, yeah, good with guns, but also smarts and, like, tactics, you know. Now, Ray is very altruistic. She's kind. She treats other people well. Now, some people say that doesn't make sense. She's been treated so badly. Why would she be, you know? But there are a number of people in real life that, in response to being treated badly, develop a lot of empathy and try to do everything they can to make sure other people are treated well. Because they don't want other people to feel as bad as they do and yeah it's really see it, it when when you watch the movie it really comes across as that's that's what's going on now and yeah john boyega is that a spoiler? yeah I, I i'm not gonna mention his character name but the i guess I don't think I am going to talk exactly about it. I'm just going to say John Boyega gives a good performance and he plays, yeah, he's, he's a, a great character. He has a lot of personality. He's funny. You know, he is one of the comic relief characters. There are definitely some parts of the movie where some people will feel, or yeah, some people do feel that the movie goes too far to get laughs out of him. And I will say it can be a little bit distracting that pretty much all of the new characters are attractive young people. You know, it's probably because the producers are scared that, you know, otherwise young viewers aren't going to go watch the movie. And honestly, I think you know there is some truth to that i know that in you know in the original trilogy the the leads you know yeah back when they were first cast they were quite young but in this movie like it even includes like officers of the first order like what were they just made officer because they're you know, related to someone who has a lot of power and influence, and I just answered my own question, I hereby withdraw this point of criticism. Now, quoting a few fellow critics, the new leads and major characters are young and bring a youthful energy with them to the movie. They have a lot of charisma. Not enough time spent developing the relationships between characters, and we're expected to care about people we barely get to know and believe that they care about each other, even though they barely know each other. And let's see. yeah, and Cosmonaut Variety Hour points out that the new characters are only superficially similar to the old ones in most ways, and definitely the most important ways. They're very different, and some of them almost the opposite of the old characters. And the new scenes are also, in a lot of ways, very different from the old ones. Again, there are some superficial similarities, but... And the... Yeah, he actually points out, you know, like, where Ray is very altruistic, very kind to others, when we first meet Luke, he's not the most appealing. He's a little, like, 
he's a little self-obsessed and like he's not very respectful towards the you know C3PO and R2D2 and just yeah you know he grows to be altruistic but at the start he's really not and and Ray like clearly from the moment we meet her you know that that's the thing like in both cases when the character endures some 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 difficult circumstances they grow to be you know unselfish and altruistic and the thing is when we meet Luke he hasn't really gone through you know the messiest thing he's ever gone through was his purse but Ray when we first meet her she's gone through years and years I mean honestly based on her age I'd say over a decade of adversity so yeah you know she has already gone through that whole and and you know that means that she starts out in a different place than Luke starts out and the journey is going to be different from for her than it was for him and I guess I will Lupita Nyong'o and Andy Serkis both appear and give really great performances. Donald Gleason plays General Hux, the commander of the First Order's Starkiller base, and yeah, he does he does a really good job. Like he basically, yeah, he he really sells it as this this fascist. And Max von Sydow doesn't have like an absolutely absurdly high amount of screen time but he's incredible in the screen time he does like yeah and let's see I guess that yeah that is what I'm gonna say about the characters so as to not spoil right I will just very briefly say there are a few you know fun cameos and yeah a lot of the aliens are handled with practical effects there are just a few that are handled with CG and like you know it's it's mocap and they're just not 100% completely convincing you can a little bit tell that it's CGI but almost all of the time when you're watching this movie if you see a robot or an alien it's it's a practical effect and it really helps sell it that is something I really really appreciate about this movie like there is that is something that you know we today we really need people in Hollywood who are willing to say no you know what I know we can do that with CG I know it would be easier not saying it's easy but easier it would you know it's it's also still time consuming but it just it feels more real when when you can like it a lot of these aliens and robots like you feel like you can practically reach through the ski screen and and like touch the the skin or metallic you know it, it just it feels so tactile and apparently a fictional language was developed for use in the film and yeah some of the characterization is definitely very like you just you see a few key things like you'll you'll see some of these characters put into circumstances that they maybe never have been in before or if they have or you know several of the characters will have to make these life or death decisions not long after we first meet them and you know obviously that's going to tell you something you know 
the the that's going to give you an idea of who they are the if if they're an honorable person or you know th these kinds of things and yeah the the movie does do you know it it can be fairly effective in in that that brings us to the cinematography which was handled by DP Dan Mendel and let's see he DP'd yeah, he returned for episode 9, so clearly J.J. was happy with him. Let's see, he DP'd Amazing Spider-Man 2, Mission Impossible 3, so yeah, they've been work. Yeah, and they did Star Trek, too. yeah, they've been working together for a while. And Skeleton Key, Shanghai Noon, Enemy of the State, yeah, he's he's very talented. And the movie tends to make it fairly easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. And the movie doesn't have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. There aren't really any unnecessary shots. Like, the camera doesn't shake, you know, a lot in action scenes. It's much easier to tell what's going on. And, you know, this is, like, that is something... I, I, I very recently rewatched Mission Impossible 3. There's a lot of good things about that movie, but boy does the shaky cam get obnoxious at times. And it would have been just completely unbearable if this movie also went completely wild with it. I it's not that there's none, but it's it's much more <clears throat> restrained. So quoting a few fellow critics here beautiful cinematography flat wide shots across the destruction of the war-torn empire top class cinematography exquisite use of color palette dynamic camera movements familiar transitions and clever angles to give its images a retro vibe and energetic cinematography, crisp, vibrant color palette. And that brings us to the editing. Marianne Brandon and Mary Jo Markey. And they have both worked on other JJ stuff. And they, let's see, yeah. You know, the editing also helps to keep it easy to follow fast moving scenes such as action scenes and keeps more calm when that's called for. There aren't really any scenes that should be cut or moved in the overall structure, trimmed down, or increased in length. And let's see, the, yeah, quoting the fellow critics here, well done editing. Firmly carried editing, firmly carried out. Yet it's 135 minute minutes of runtime feels slightly overlong. I would say like it's a movie where they move, they go from place to place a lot. You know, not a huge surprise as for a Star Wars movie. I felt like at least two of those places should have just have been combined. But that's not really an editing thing. That's a that's a writing thing. They wouldn't have been able to to edit it so that it's but but yeah, like some of the time, like they would, yeah. And yeah, the the special effects are. I I would say all of it, all of the, by and large, the special effects are quite good, and many of them are are seamless. It's mostly when the the kind of animated character and and it's really not like it's not a huge part of the movie that are these animated characters there's way way more practical now Abrams intention in prioritizing practical special effects was to recreate the visual realism and authenticity of the original Star Wars to that end 
The droid BB-8 was a physical prop developed by Disney Research, created by special effects artist Neil Scanlon, and operated live on set with the actors. And... Yeah. And there's some great stunt work as well. Now, the budget was estimated to be somewhere between 259 to 306 million dollars and it made over 2 billion at the box office now let's see it was yeah so so filming locations include Ireland oh, let's not say is that okay. I, I I yeah it, it says it right there. Iceland, Abu Dhabi, New Mexico, yeah, so, you know, some, some nicely distinct places, and it does, like, you know, there is, in fact, another desert planet in this movie, but they actually did go out and shoot in the desert. And, yeah, it feels very real. Like, it is, you know, you can practically feel the, the heat of the, of the desert planet and the cold of the... I guess I won't give... Yeah, there's, there's at least one setting that's cold. And... Yeah, I, I really appreciate, you know, it has sets, not just CG and green screen. And, yeah, so the action. There are countless jokes about how the Stormtroopers have terrible aim, but in the original trilogy, it's really more of a case of all the good guys have plot armor, because whenever they aren't shooting at someone with plot armor, they are great shots, and... Ultimately, yeah, that's still the case. If they're shooting at someone without plot armor, they're great shots. The movie has some really huge, impactful explosions. There's a lot less lightsaber fights and lightsaber use in general since the prequels way overdid it. This understands that you shouldn't try to do more than those. Instead, you should try to do it better, make it more compelling. And that was something... I talked about in my videos on the prequels, like, by the third movie, it's like, okay, you know, everybody has a lightsaber, everybody's constantly turning on lightsabers, and, and you know, like, like the, the, the way that they swing them, it, it doesn't look like something that, like, it just, it feels, it feels completely separated from, we, we can't, we can't really... Like, our brain can perceive, okay, it's, you know, the, the way it's moving and such, but we don't really get, a, like, it might as well be, like, a, a dance or something. It doesn't feel dangerous to us. And in this movie, it feels dangerous again. And the action scenes aren't, like, these big, extremely confusing action scenes. And, yeah, you know, the lightsaber fights in the prequels felt too choreographed. Here they feel visceral and real. Now, but yeah, you know, you've got chases on foot and in vehicles. You've got physical fights, shooting, including shooting while, while in vehicles. You've got lightsaber action. There's a, there's a good amount and variety to the action in this movie like you know it doesn't have yeah let's see yeah that's technically a spoiler it, it yeah it has a it has a good variety you know it's not just scene after scene of the exact same kind of action and it finds a good balance between homaging the action we've already seen in the original trilogy and finding something new to do that feels Star Wars. That was also, you know, some, some of the action in the prequels 
didn't feel like something that would really belong in the original trilogy, and the, it, it felt less Star Wars-y than something. And yeah, here they, they go back and see, well, what what was the action like in the original trilogy, and how can we do something that's similar, but with, you know, the new kind of, yeah, you know, f filmed and edited the way that kind of thing is done today. Now, the villains and antagonists are very compelling. I think it's very impressive that this manages to not have too many villains because it seems like there should be, but somehow they manage. Like, I will say, you know, they don't all have a lot of screen time, but it didn't feel like they had too little either. And, yeah, I wouldn't say any of the villains are overexposed. Really, no character in this is overexposed. I know some people do get tired of some of the characters, but I honestly, I think if you get tired of a character in this, it... Okay, I'm not going to pass judgment. I'm just saying, when I see other people's reviews of it, or read what people have written when they talk about, you know, some, yeah, some people did think that I, they, they didn't like Ray that much, or they tired of John Boyega's character, and it just, it comes across more like they just don't really like that there are now minorities in Star Wars. Actually, yeah, I suppose I haven't mentioned that, but if you don't know, John Boyega is a black man, so, you know, it's, yeah, and... I'm not saying, like, I don't think it's impossible to have a problem. Like, I'm not saying their characters are perfectly handled, but when you look at people who really don't like those characters, there tend to be, like, sexism and racism involved. Now, the music is still handled by John Williams, who, I mean, really, he does do at least some music for every single main Star Wars movie. That's also something that I'm kind of intrigued by. He didn't do music for Solo. I'm, I'm, he, he did for Rogue One, so it's not that he, oh, he only does the main episodes. Solo is the only Star Wars movie that he doesn't score at all, and I'm, I'm, I, I look forward to, to hearing what it sounds like. I love his work, but I do think in order to keep Star Wars interesting, you know, you gotta, experiment with with some of the elements and yeah I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and quote a fellow uh, oh right right basically you know I, I listened to some of it here on YouTube and basically it sounds like it could be for the original trilogy except there's a more modern flavor but it's not like ruined, you know, it does, it's still very recognizably Star Wars and, and Star Wars episode Star Wars as well. Quoting fellow critics, John Williams delivers yet another rousing score that has its own character, but cleverly includes the well-known iconic themes from the previous films. Now... The score doesn't add a ton of new flavor to the series, but it sure feels like Star Wars. The film score is by John Williams. It's just amazing and enduring. And the sound design also continues to be excellent. You know, there, there are new things in this that I suppose... Yeah, it's not really a spoiler to say that there is something different about the lightsaber of Kylo Ren. And 
you know, some people really couldn't stand that it's so different. I feel like if it, if it was just like shallow, if there wasn't a reason for it, or there was zero explanation, and basically the, the they don't verbally explain it in this movie, but it's is that spoiler? I guess what what I'll say is it goes well with his personality. And yeah, like there, it, it feels like it can just barely be contained within the blade. It feels like it's gonna any second now it's gonna explode out of the lightsaber, and the the noise of it really reflects that. And, and that's again like you gotta really think about without the sound design, it's just a visual effect, you know. So they they had to. Yeah, they, they came up with something that sounds like a corrupted lightsaber, you know, like, Kylo Ren is not Darth Vader. There is something, something different, there's something wrong here, and, and they do a really good job with that. And, again, making it still fit within the Star Wars. Now, the comedy... I'm going to quote a few fellow critics here. Some people say that it's trying too hard to be funny. A lot of it isn't funny. Others say that the comedy works really well. And... Right. An infusion of modern-day humor that sometimes steers the movie this close to self-parody, but never sarcastically, nor at the expense of a terrific time. Situational comedy, like in episode 4. Too many in-jokes. Too many, too much humor in the last third of the film. Yeah, I, I think there is definitely some truth to that. But yeah, I would definitely, I, I don't think the movie was ruined by comedy. You know, cer certainly, me personally, I was more bothered by the convenient writing. Now. Yeah, in, in pacing wise, in some ways, it's like episode four, but faster and at least a little bit bigger. And that does work fairly well. Now. So, yeah, the, the movie is two hours and seven minutes long without end credits, and two hours and 19 minutes long with end credits. And. I would say it's worth watching at least once if you know if, if you are a fan of the original trilogy watch it at least once and if you don't want to watch it more after that then you know but I do think there are some really interesting elements you know and some of these interesting elements I knew about because for years I didn't think I was ever gonna watch these movies so I listened to a bunch of spoilers there weren't a there yeah by the time I watched this there weren't a lot of surprises left but a lot of it still worked for me. And I don't think, if I hadn't known any of it, I think I would still have been really bothered by how many conveniences there were in the writing. I would say the best element of the movie is the, yeah, I guess it's tied between the Star Wars feel and the metatextual approach to the material. And uh, I think ultimately the worst aspect is some of the, the JJ mystery writing, the conveniences, and it is at times a little too eager to reference and imitate the original trilogy. And the thing I was most worried about for the movie was JJ's unsatisfying storytelling. And, yeah, I mean, I, th I think I would be, I, I already know what, some of what they do with these characters in the next two movies, so that helped really temper it, but I think if I had just, if I had watched this in 2015, I would have felt like I knew I shouldn't have watched it, so I'm really glad I waited. And the thing I was most looking forward to was more authentic Star Wars feel, and the movie 
lived up to my expectations, and in some parts exceeded them. The trailers do give away too much, but they also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailers, you're, you're more likely to like the movie than if you don't. And the cover and poster give away too much, but again, give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. So, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 93% critic score and based on 445 reviews and an 85% audience score based on over 100,000 ratings. And the critics' consensus is packed with action and populated by both familiar faces and fresh blood. Force Awakens successfully recalls the series' former glory while injecting it with renewed energy. And yeah, 412 of those reviews are fresh, so yeah. And on Metacritic, it has 80 out of 100 and 6.7 out of 10 for users. On IMDb, it has a 7.8. And there are 4,998 user reviews on IMDb and 912 links in the IMDb external reviews section. And the IMDb users, let's see, 26.3% gave it an 8, 20.3% gave it a 9, 18.4% gave it a, a 10, 17.7% .7 gave it a 7. So yeah, it was very well received. And... Yeah, I recommend watching Pop Culture Detective's video, The Stormtrooper Paradox, but do note, it spoils the movie. And yeah, I recommend this to fans of J.J. Abrams and of the original trilogy. And, you know, Disney Plus has all of the Star Wars movies and most of the shows. And it has seven minutes of deleted scenes one 12 minute interview with Daisy Ridley and John Boyega so yeah that's not, that's not a lot of, ex of of special features on Disney Plus Com comparatively it has like the episodes 4 and 5 have a huge amount so I give this seven winks and nods at longtime fans out of ten. And that brings us to the spoiler sections, the thoughts sections. Starting with disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of this very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section, once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So, from here on out, spoilers for this entire movie. And, let's see, so yeah, the... the I am glad that this is a sequel to the original trilogy. I I quite like the way it comments on the the movies, the the yeah the original trilogy and the tropes. I think I will yeah I'll I'll go more into that in in one of the next two sections. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is MC3, Rift Jacks, and other jokes. The time codes follow the sections on the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts on how while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts I had before watching.
Now, right. Does the empathy? Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? So that would definitely. Let's see. Kylo Ren, General Hux, and. Snoke. I would definitely say that there is some empathy for Kylo Ren. The movie does... Ah, let's see, what's the word? Like, it, it's, it's this interesting inversion of, you know, Darth Vader was seduced by the dark side of the Force. And Kylo Ren is worried that he'll be seduced by the light side of the Force. And yeah, I, I thought that, you know, and, and I hear it's going to be even more interesting in, the, in Episode 8. So, yeah. Hux and Snoke, I wouldn't really say there's any empathy for from the movie and really that is the right choice you know they're they're supposed to be the kind of villains you really hate and just ah, what's the word we, we can't wait to see them be defeated now That brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. A stormtrooper managed to hit the ship. Poe was surprised that his plot armor did not extend to his ship as well. I do appreciate the moral grade that the stormtrooper whose death inspires Finn to leave the First Order was killed by Poe. Sure would be great if Finn wasn't the only stormtrooper to be humanized, since the rest of them are still treated as disposable cannon fodder. We're supposed to cheer as the good guys gun them down and blow them up. Again, I recommend The Stormtrooper Paradox by Pop Culture Detective. Man, even when Max Sadal is barely given any lines or screen time, he still acts the heck out of a scene. The villagers kill them all. Even the ones that we suspect might have the map. Especially those ones. Then I guess when it comes to the buildings that might hold the maps. Destroy them indiscriminately. And we're introduced to Ray, and just within minutes, we see, you know, she gets very little food and water, and she's only paid in food, so there's no way that she could, like, save up money and improve her situation. She works really hard. If she takes even a second or two of break of scrubbing the stuff she hands in that she salvaged, she'll get abused verbally. She's alone. She puts on the rebel helmet, so she must be in favor of the rebels. You know, no... I mean, okay, she salvaged it, but would you do that if it was, like, the bad guy? So, you know, clearly she... The moment she realizes that BB-8, a stranger to her, is being kidnapped by someone, wants to sell him for parts, she frees him, and then refuses to sell him, despite how much food it would get her. And, you know, yeah, at first she doesn't want BB-8 to go with her, but she does end up agreeing, saying only until the morning. She, you know, we find out she's waiting for her family to come back for her. Sixty portions. She's never in her life seen that much food in one place. Certainly not accessible to her all. And that is, like, you know, if, if you, dear viewer, have never experienced, like, going hungry, it, like, if you, if you, 
going hungry can really, really like mess with you. That that is, you know, you you do anything to get some food, and just yeah, you know, for for someone who usually goes hungry, which clearly she does, to see that much food and turn it down, you know, that really, you know, clearly she is a, a you know, very selfless person. I like that Poe calls Finn on his BS. He's not saving it because it's the right thing to do. He needs a pilot. So the action with the TIE Fighter is quite exciting and tense, but it does feel kind of forced that they don't just unplug the, like, I guess fuel pump thing. Although if if Jedi Knight, Jedi Outcast is anything to go by, it can take minutes to figure out how to to get the fuel pump thing going. So maybe they didn't want to mess with that. I can respect that. But yeah, you know, they don't pull out the the fuel pump and like at first, they can't just tear loose, but then, ultimately, they can tear loose. You know, it, it just it feels like they needed some excuse for, for the, you know, for the stormtroopers to fire upon that TIE fighter. And then they do a really great job flying away and shooting the missiles, but then one of the missiles hits, I guess, the idea is supposed to be you know, like Finn and Poe were arguing and so not paying attention, but it really feels like it's just there so that the two can get separated. And wow, it really does not look at all, at all, excuse me, at all like Poe could possibly have survived that. I mean, I guess like maybe it was, at first I thought, oh, you know, maybe it's like a test screening, but no, he's in too much of the movie for it to just have been like you know but maybe maybe when they filmed the scene where he was supposed to die at that time the idea was that he wouldn't appear later in the movie at all and like a studio exec realized oh hey you know this guy's going to be a super popular character let's bring him back and and the movie does the movie basically pretends like it doesn't even need to explain how he survived that. And it just, yeah, like, if hypothetically it could, they could just, like, normally, like, yeah, let's just briefly, hypothetically, let's say that their TIE fighter wasn't hit. Presumably, let's see, the... Actually, where were they headed? I guess they weren't actually headed. No, wait, yeah, right. They were going to go to Jakku briefly, but only for BB-8. So, so yeah, basically, like, hypothetically, their TIE fighter doesn't get shot. So they land on Jakku. They they ask, you know, have you seen BB-8? Yeah, they, they try to track down BB-8. And, yeah, it's, uh, you know, basically... The movie kind of needs Ray to believe that Finn is resistance, otherwise she's not they're they're not gonna go together. And yeah, it just it's too many too many coincidences. Finn runs towards Ray thinking she needs rescue and then is visibly confused when she manages to fend them off on her own. I've seen some say that there's no way that Rey should consider Luke Skywalker just a myth, but she lives really far away. Think about how little Luke knew about the Rebels and the Empire at the start of A New Hope. And in real life, like, if you find a small village in a Western country, they won't be as up-to-date on news that people who live in the city are. And also, think about if you heard about the events of the original trilogy wouldn't you think that they were at least, at the very least, like, exaggerated? Like, think think about, we, we've we seen them, we've watched the movies, so we've seen them firsthand. But imagine, if a friend of a friend, of a neighbor, of a parent, of an uncle, of a cousin, heard, oh yeah, yeah, 
there's this kid he used to be a farmer then he became a Jedi his father was one of the most evil people alive and he was like he, he, he would like with his mind choke people and they they would like duel with with these lightsabers and twice Luke blew up the death or well okay once he blew up the Death Star the other time it was you know the other rebels and such but like wouldn't you think okay that there's no way that's completely true now I like a brief bit where the duo are flying the Millennium Falcon and they shoot down a TIE fighter and the scavenger runs up to it and yells something in an alien language I'm guessing dibs because you know to this scavenger this is Christmas it's gonna get so much food from this thing because we're now no longer thinking of Ray as just a scavenger anymore so it's a it's a nice reminder of how quickly things can change it's very sweet that right after the flight Ray and Finn give each other a lot of compliments on the shooting and flying respectively the droid stole a freighter okay don't lie you would definitely watch a Star Wars movie where that happened just between us I'm not with the resistance okay somehow with just body language BB-8 expresses you lied to us like it's it's like go back and watch it it's especially if you have Div Disney Plus so it's not gonna like scratch the disc or anything just like the way it like it no you know it's it's like it's it's a betrayal it's not just like you know it's not this robotic kind of hmm, something I thought was true is actually false interesting it's just like it's you know it's it's like if it, yeah like like a like a dog or something being being surprised by something it's just decent fake out we think it's the first order you know attacking the falcon but it's just Han and Chewie aborting the falcon but it's just Han and Chewie the Raftar is killing the gangs and almost reaching Han, Chewie, you know, like, it's it's right out of a monster movie. And Finn does almost die by Raftar. And Chewie gets hit by one of the gang members, so now Ray has to be co-pilot. And, you know, Chewie and his wound is, like, Finn is trying to tend to the wounds. But it's like dealing with a pet that has a wound or needs to be bathed or something. And I, you know, like Han is like, don't you abuse Chewie. I'm, I'm trying to help Chewie. And he's tried to kill me like six times. And then Chewie gets up close and he's like, which is fine. The nightmarish, nightmarish visions that Ray has in the basement of Maz Kanata castle are quite effective. Hux does make a very convincing Hitler. You have to go back. You have to go back, eight. I mean, Finn specifically asked Han if there could be First Order sympathizers at Maz Kanata's castle, and minutes later someone contacts the First Order. I, th I guess that's what they call lamp shading. It's it's like seriously like I uh, and Maz Kanata is on their side. Like Maz Kanata isn't like neutral or something. Oh, you're alive. So are you? Well, yeah, but the fact that he's still alive is substantially less absurd. Which is to say, it's still extremely absurd. Seriously all the things that he survived in this movie the crash isn't the end of it I really appreciate the conversation between Han and Leia about their son it's very resonant this is how parents talk and feel when they believe they've lost a child it, it would be so boring if it was just like completely shallow superficial kind of yeah but you know the, the and and like Hypothetically, if these exact same lines were in a movie in the 70s, I'm not sure people would have been ready for it. But by 2015, you know, not only were we ready for it, we were we would not have been okay with just the 
completely yeah it, it needed to be as complex and intelligently done as that Ray keeps trying to pull off a Jedi mind trick and the third time's the charm you will pat yourself on the head and good conversation between Han and Ben it really does say a lot and has a lot to say about father and son relationships I know what I have to do but I don't know if I have the strength to do it what Han believes Ben is and and what we want to believe is that he means come back to the good guys come back to his family but what he actually means is killing Han and I appreciate we do see clearly it does have an emotional impact on Kylo to kill Han right after Han falls off the catwalk we get like a very powerful close-up you know once you've watched a number of action scenes in this movie you realize that stormtroopers tie fighters you know various enemies for the good guys to fight will appear and disappear as needed and if the good guys are supposed to flee there's too many to fight. If they're supposed to win, there's just few enough that they can defeat them. And right outside Maz Kanata, I th that was that was something that really like right outside Maz Kanata, it goes from the good guys being able to gun down every stormtrooper that tries to shoot them to there being far too many of them to fight, and suddenly they're taking prisoners because if not, then they wouldn't have survived. And if they if there hadn't been so many, then the X-wings wouldn't have any had anyone to shoot or rescue. And it just I really feel like that was I think they should have chosen either they were able to gun down the stormtroopers or they were just rescued by the the X-wing because wow that really made it feel completely like what's the word like it's basically just there for for the entertainment it has no weight to it anymore the the yeah I don't especially have anything to say about the climactic lightsaber action that you know I already mentioned you know some of the stuff is written in the IMDb frequently asked questions some of it is you know I, I want to say cinema wins and Sean do good jobs covering it so the soft reboot thing basically the movie recreates a number of things from a new hope but the scenes are not in the same order the importance is not the same and there's some key changes and it is actually saying something about the original trilogy there are multiple bits where you know Ray points out she doesn't need anyone to rescue her in some ways she resembles Leia and as much as I love Leia's character and think she's awesome in the original trilogy at the end of the day those movies still you know they were still written to where on multiple occasions she needed other character characters to rescue her but Rey rescues herself the most you can say is she might have needed someone someone's help to get her off Starkiller base we don't know exactly what would have happened if the others hadn't shown up to help her get out of there and certainly Finn went there because he felt he needed to rescue her. He keeps not learning that lesson, really. You know, Maz Kanata's castle bears a superficial resemblance to the cantina, but it accomplishes a completely different thing for the plot, and one could go on. But yeah, the... the honestly, if Rey had just had to go around on her own, I think there's a decent chance that she would have kept eluding the the storm yeah stormtroopers they're still called stormtroopers and eventually would have gotten just you know gotten in herself into the cockpit of a tie fighter and flown away and and that would have been you know yeah let's see I think yeah I think that is what I have to say about it in in this section rather And that brings us to notes taken before watching.
Now, in the early drafts, according to Wikipedia, Michael Arndt, in, in early drafts, he had Luke Skywalker appear midway through the film, but Arndt found that every time Luke came in and entered the movie, he just took it over. Suddenly, you didn't care about your main character anymore. So the writers decided to use Luke as the film's MacGuffin, and something the protagonists needed to find would not appear in person until the final scene. And quoting a fellow critic, Ben Solo makes sure he's always angry. It's not that he loses control of himself, it's on purpose. Because he's afraid that otherwise he'll lose his strong abilities, which are based on the negative emotions of of the yeah. And he's, you know, yes, because he's afraid of being seduced by the light side, he covers his face and body even though he has nothing to hide. He's, you know, like, once you see Vader's face out of the helmet, you completely understand, like, this guy has to command troops. He's not going to go around with this pale, bad, like, damaged, wounded face you know, obviously the the you know he's going to cover all of that up, and the the most of the suit is there to to like as we learn in episode three, like he legitimately he has all he has uh, yeah he he has none of his original limbs, both of his arms and legs were you know cut off by a lightsaber, so you know he needs the 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 suit, but Kylo really does like he could just he could he could take it all off and he would be fine but he wants people to think of him as Darth Vader and yeah so you know talking about the meta textual I'm not the first person to, to note this but yeah Kylo Ren is basically a Darth Vader fanboy cosplaying as Darth Vader he doesn't need the mask or the suit and he's not completely evil, even though he claims to. You know, when when he's having serious trouble killing his father, you can clearly tell. And and afterwards, he's emotionally distraught because of it. You know, think about how rarely Vader had trouble. Like, it's not never, but in the original trilogy, like, really the only times that Vader actually like hesitates or doesn't kill like he ends up throwing the the emperor down a, a shaft I'm resisting the temptation to make a shaft joke but other than that you know like he for a lot of it he knows that he's that it's his own son he's dealing with and he's still like uses a lightsaber and at attacks him repeatedly, you know. Like, he, he does ultimately redeem himself by killing the Emperor, but Kylo Ren is way, way further... Like, he, he has a, lot, a long way to go before he's as confidently evil and as irredeemable as Vader was for most of the original trilogy. I mean, really... This whole idea of redeeming him, I mean, maybe at the very end of Empire, you start to think about it, but otherwise, it's really only for Return of the Jedi that we're thinking about. You know, if you watch the first movie, like, you really get the sense, okay, this is going to end with Luke killing Vader to get revenge for, or, or at the very least, someone needs to kill him. He's not going to be redeemed, you know. Now, Harrison Ford wanted his character to die in Episode 6 if he was going to return after Episode 5 at all. So, I can't help but imagine that the moment that he and J.J. first met, immediately J.J. said, Don't worry, your, your character gets to die this time. And the moment he said that, you know, Harrison gets, gets that broad smile on his face. And, you know, he lowers his index finger, which 
knowing Harrison Ford was going right up into JJ's face and said, well, why didn't you say so? Now, let's see, a number of people do not like that, you know, the the closest thing to Luke Skywalker in this movie is Rey. And the, the, and yeah, for a number of them, it's, it's sexism, but not all of them. I'm not saying all of them. I mean, George Lucas was originally considering for Luke to be a woman when, you know, you, you can, like, you can look on Wikipedia for, for that. Not saying everything on Wikipedia is to be trusted, but, like, and, yeah, you know, in, in this, like, you know, leave, runs into a, a droid which has important information for the rebel slash resistance leaves their desert planet where they feel like they don't have you know the the yeah they they you know they're not like out having adventure they're stuck in a in a very boring repetitive you know kind of existence helps the rebels you know goes to the death star helps destroy the Death Star, you know, starts to, to be able to use some force abilities. And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that it's automatically good just because the original trilogy did it and did it well, or that it's okay to just do the exact same thing, but it, as I've already talked about, she's really not the same character as 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 Luke there are some similarities but yeah it just like some people seem to have so, seem to really resent the fact that a character that is this much like Luke was in A New Hope is now played by a woman now fellow youtuber Sean Chandler talks about movies does a great job explaining why this movie did not need the Death Star Personally, I would go further than him and say there shouldn't be a Death Star at all in this movie. They should have come up with something else that demonstrates how powerful the First Order is. And the fact that given 30 plus years, they could not come up with something other than that. Just another Death Star. When that was one of the problems of Episode 6. That, oh, it's just another Death Star. That was one of the big things that made me take forever to finally get around to watching this movie, even when everybody praised it, even though, you know, some people pointed out that there shouldn't be a Death Star in this movie, but, like, it's it's one thing that Lucas couldn't think of anything else between episodes four and six. I mean, at the end of the day, those movies came out six years apart, and, you know, it takes some time to write, and he obviously, you know, they, they did extensive effects work on both of the Death Stars. So the fact that it's a Death Star, that was written a long time in advance of, you know, so, but 30 plus years and another Death Star. And it's like, the movie's not even about, the movie's about them trying to get the map so that they can find Luke. Now, since episodes 8 and 9 also have some threat to the good guys from the bad guys, I'm not going to speak to exactly what I think it should have been in this movie in place of the Death Star, since I can't comment further on it without spoiling them. But yeah, in, in my video for episode 9, I'll talk about alternatives to a Death Star. Now, let's see here. There we go. So, with Kylo Ren, instead of a father turning evil, being redeemed by his son, we have a son turning evil and his father attempting to redeem him. And Kylo kills Han Solo, where Darth Vader killed Ben Kenobi. 
instead of waiting for the third movie for him to take his mask off and him being very scarred, he takes it off in this movie. And yeah, in the first movie he's in, then we see that he isn't scarred at all. Also, the scene where he kills Han Solo also has elements of Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker interacting at the very end of Empire Strikes Back, as well as the very ending of Return of the Jedi, where Darth Vader appeals to Luke by revealing that he is his father. Han attempts to appeal to Kylo by saying he still loves him as a father, and Han is basically trying to do the opposite of the t Emperor's tempting of Luke, trying to convince him to come back to the light side. So, right. Hux passionately delivers an address, and I just really badly want there to be an outtake where one of the soldiers yells up to him, Why are you shouting like that? And he responds, I have stubbed my toe! The doctors think it is broken, but I am still going to give my speech! And he finishes it, and within a second or two, apparently every single trooper there has an important question for the teacher. Now, as I said in the review, these are clearly Nazis. I realize that some people will say it's in bad taste to make jokes about Nazis. First of all, I would not be doing it with the real Nazis. These are fictional Nazis. I leave mocking real Nazis to the mas in the masterful hands of Mel Brooks. Seriously, the original The Producers is freaking amazing. I wouldn't be able to get it completely right. But I do joke about these fictional Nazis in the same spirit. The way to defeat the Nazis is by mocking and humiliating them. For a lot of modern day Nazis, you cannot deconvert them with logical arguments because that wasn't what converted them in the first place. With mocking, humiliation, and shaming, you can. And Kylo Ren dramatically removes the helmet, and I'm just like, yeah, I don't know who you are. Helmet back on. Helmet back on. And Kylo gets the bad news and throws his temper tantrum and then goes, anything else? They spray paint on the wall. Your Darth Vader cosplay sucks. And, you know, after... The, the choking Kyle goes off to sulk in his room, brood, read Edgar Allan Poe, listen to Evanescence, and another, you know, is that supposed to be an officer? Whatever. You know, yeah, the fellow officer goes up and said, they didn't spray paint that, and the other one's like, it's true though. Your mother and I miss you. With every blaster shot so far, and she was like, but I won't. Now, one of J.J.'s tropes is having something really dramatic happen with characters that we've only barely met. Sure, we didn't expect it yet, because usually it only happens after more screen time, but often they're not as effective because there's been so little screen time. And I've seen some people say that that's kind of what happens when Kylo kills Han. We've barely seen these two characters. It's the first time we see these two characters interact with each other, We've barely seen Kylo's face. I I think an argument can be made that it, it I would say that it would have been stronger if we had had more screen time with the the two of them. Now, but I do understand doing it, and I do think it was there definitely needed to be an expectation subversion there. And, yeah, like, at, at first, it looked like, you know, Han might be able to talk down Ben. But then instead, he goes ahead and, and kills him, which, you know, we expected, like, it's a new hope. So, yeah, he's probably going to kill, like, it, yeah, it wasn't a huge stretch that Han was going to be in the one he ended up killing. He's the, the one closest to Ben Solo, Ben Kenobi, at that point, but... And the, what was the thing, let's see, that was the thing that I wanted to point out, let's see, the, ah, it's right on the tip of my tongue, right, another thing is that in a new hope, you know, like, you you might say, well, we've barely seen, like, it's the first time we see Ben Kenobi and Darth Vader interact in A New Hope. Yes, but throughout A New Hope, Ben is always talking about what happened with Darth Vader, how evil he is, how dangerous he is, all this stuff, and talking about like, he, does, he doesn't make a big deal about how he himself is good with the Force, but we get that that's 
you know, he is good with the Force, and he's talking about how important it is to, you know, yeah, he's talking about the Force, so we know, we know what both of them are like, so when they do start attacking each other with lightsabers, yeah, you know, there is more of an emotional investment when, like, yeah, we knew before that scene, we already knew that Kylo's father was Han Solo, but Han barely talks about Kylo, and I'm not saying that it wouldn't have made a lot of sense for him to constantly talk about him, but given that they wanted the movie to end with Kylo stabbing Han, they did need to put a little bit more development in there for that. Now, yeah, and, and the, the good guys in this movie are looking for Luke Skywalker, and the movie ends with a Force-sensitive person meeting him. Presumably, he's training her in the next movie, so they combined Ben Kenobi and Yoda and had Ben not be found until the very end of the movie. There's a deleted scene on Disney Plus where Chewbacca rips off the arm of an alien now we, you know, we, do we ever see, I don't think we see him do that in the original trilogy, so this is confirming he does do that. And you can do whatever you want to aliens as long as it's not humans getting their arms ripped off, so saith the MPAA. Now, it wouldn't be interesting just bringing back Han Solo and Leia Organa, or now Leia Solo. You have to... You have to put them in a place, in a situation that's different from the last time we saw them. Now, some fans don't like that Solo isn't helping out the resistance the way that he helped out the rebellion. And, you know, the, the movie's explanation is when his son turned evil, that was, you know, that was his way of coping. And that's, like, that's something that's an issue for him in the original trilogy. He has trouble... Like, he's, he kind of, he doesn't, he doesn't stick around. And I think, you know, like, your, your son becoming something so awful, like, that really does, yeah, that would break your spirit. Now, Leia is still, you know, she was in the Rebel Alliance, now she's in the Resistance, now she's a general, not a princess. She was in the Rebel Alliance longer than Han was. And, you know, ultimately it is also, for a really long time, strong role models in fiction were most were almost always men. I, I think it's really important for more strong female role models as well. Now, let's see. Some let's, yeah, some some viewers had you know, really don't, really can't accept the way that Rey handles herself with a lightsaber against Kylo, since he is more experienced and strong with the Force, and has more training. Now, I've, I mean, I have already, yeah, I'm just very briefly going to go through, you know, this is what some others have already pointed out, but you know, part of the reason that, you know, it, yeah, among the reasons that it goes as well for her as it does is he's wounded. Think about how, like, he was shot in the side with with Chewie's Wookiee bowcaster. Think about, like, other times we see Chewie fired in this movie, like, people go flying, it causes explosions. Like, by all rights, it should have killed Kylo on the spot. He's using a lot of his concentration and force ability. Like, as far as I can tell, he's basically, like, concentrating a lot of his inner, a lot of his focus. Concentrating his focus? He's, he's concentrating on 
using the force, the, the telekinetic ability of the force to hold the, the, the wound closed you know, and, and still some blood comes out, but like by all rights, he should have a huge gaping wound. He should he should be bleeding to death, you know. So, you know that that takes away a lot of his um, yeah. That makes him not perform as well in the fight. He's emotional because he just killed his father, which we can tell really did affect him emotionally. In part, he is toying with her, like, you know, like a, like a cat that's caught a mouse. And, let's see, and he's also, he's trying to convince her, you know, throughout the fight, he keeps telling her, you need a teacher. I'll, you know, join me. And, you know, she's good with the saber, because there's not a huge difference in size, shape, and weight, obviously, in how effective of a weapon it is between the lightsaber and the stick that we've seen she's good at fighting with and some people don't like oh how she's so good at fighting well she's been alone since she was like five years old I think it was Turf Nation who pointed out early on I'm sure she did lose a lot of fights but you know she she got better at fighting and I forget if he said the following but I will if she hadn't become really good at fighting she would probably be either a slave or possibly have been killed like someone would have someone would have killed her to steal the stuff she scavenged or something you know people do sometimes you know p p starving people do sometimes end up killing other starving people for the food now let's see I copied in some stuff I want to see if Yeah, yeah, some of this is, is quite fun. The, yeah, so this is IMDb trivia. When Finn and Rey ask Han is he, if he is the Han Solo, he replies, I used to be, which is a reply Ford himself regularly uses when fans ask if he is Harrison Ford. Actually, yeah, now that I, I didn't want to mention in the review itself that he played a big role in this, but... As others have noted, he gives a really good performance in this, and he was in way more of the movie than I thought he was going to be. So he must really have felt like it was a good idea to bring back the character and worthy to, yeah. Because I haven't watched that many of his more recent movies, but I hear he he kind of phones roles in, which also like, I mean, he's in at his age. I can understand not. Being and and some of the movies he's worked on more recently have been pretty bad, you know. I mean, he used to be in really great stuff, so it's it's frustrating. Now, let's see, I'm yeah, more I'm to be trivia. Mark Hamill claimed George Lucas nonchalantly told him over lunch a new Star Wars trilogy was going to be made by Disney, and if he did not want to be involved, Luke Skywalker would simply be written out of the script. However, Hamill immediately agreed to reprise the role. Hamill admitted. Admitted, however, that he pretended to be nonchalant about it, so it didn't seem like he was excited for the role. He also said, within five seconds, Carrie Fisher exclaimed she'd do it and asked if there was a part for her daughter, Billy Lord, which, as far as, apparently there was. I, I don't, I can't exactly say which of them, but one of the resistant, fi resistant spiders is apparently played by her daughter. Now... Okay, so Kevin Smith and Benedict Cumberbatch visited the set. Smith, infamous for his open and talkative nature, was forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement, and J.J. Abrams had World War II-style propaganda posters titled Loose Lips Sink Starships hung up around the set. 
as a reminder to, to Smith not to reveal spoilers for the film to the public. True to his word, the only tidbit, tidbit Smith revealed about his visit was that he cried when he stood on the Millennium Falcon set, as it reminded him of how much he loved Star Wars as a child. The um, right, Ray's outfit is inspired by early drawings from Star Wars concept artist Ralph McQuarrie for Luke Skywalker. At a point when he and George Lucas were playing with the idea of making look Luke woman. Now. The, um, um, now let's see the um, Right, Brad Bird and Matthew Vaughn reportedly turned down the chance to direct. Bird had already committed to Tomorrowland, forcing him to decline. Vaughn entered negotiations, even vacating the director's role on X Men Days of Future Past. So that's how that happened. That was actually going. To, I mean, I could understand. Like, First Class did quite well, so I could understand them wanting to stick with him, but that's how. We ended up with Ryan Singer directing another. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something for me to be grateful to this movie for. Now, yeah, Matthew Vaughn eventually declined over creative differences, reportedly disputes over the level of violence in the film. Yeah, I mean, he tends to make fairly violent movies. And his wanting to cast Chloe Grace Moretz as the female lead. Yeah, because they work on the kick-ass movies. I mean, I could I could see her play Ray, But one thing, like, when they cast Daisy, both Daisy Ridley and John Boyega, they wanted to cast unknowns, like how George Lucas cast the original a new hope. Now, right, unlike J.J. Abrams, they would have they would had likely done original stories that weren't soft reboots of the original Star Wars, 1977, and thus they would have been far better received by George Lucas. Now. The naming BB-8, BB-8, was J.J. Abrams' idea because he thought he looks like a B and an 8. And, yeah, that is, yeah. Before Adam Driver was cast as the villain, Michael Fassbender was considered for the role. He could definitely also have done it. I mean, one thing is, though, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he could have done it, but... I mean, considering how good of a job Adam Driver does here, like... I feel like he really deserved to, to show how good of, a, of an actor he is. Now he, like... 
this really gave him a career. He's been a bunch of stuff where he really so so yeah, you know, I mean Michael Fassbender he already really got to prove that he can do incredible acting and he also has a career, so yeah. Ray continues the tradition of disparaging the Millennium Falcon when she calls it garbage. In the original trilogy, Luke called the Millennium Falcon a piece of junk and later referred to it as a bucket of bolts. Elizabeth Olsen, Jennifer Lawrence, and Shailene Woodley were considered for the role of Ray. Olsen refused the audition for the role because she already had a contract with Marvel Studios for the role of Scarlet Witch in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because the shoot dates for this movie overlapped with Avengers Age of Ultron. I could, they, they could have done really well in the role as well, but yeah, and, and Olsen and Lawrence have careers also. You know, this was supposed to launch Daisy Ridley's, although, sadly, she has not gotten that much other work. I, you know, I maybe because of how how hated her role in these three movies is, and it really sucks. And Shannon Woodley, I think she does have a career as well, and has been able to prove in other movies that she really can you know, can give an incredible acting performance. Kylo Ren's lightsaber blade is the first whose energy blade is always shaking or crackling. It indicates Kylo Ren's violent behavior and his feelings impregnated by the dark side of the Force. Also in the Blu-ray extras, it is told that his weapon is not yet finished. Kylo Ren originally would have been a dark Jedi called the Jedi Killer, who was more akin to Darth Vader and would power up by directly absorbing the energy of a star. At one point, he was going to be straight up Darth Vader impersonator, wearing an exact copy of his suit in order to mess with Luke. Mess with Luke. That's that is some straight up comic book, right? Yeah, <laughs> I can appreciate that. That's yeah. And, yeah, so here's another list of, okay, I'm not going to repeat all the ones that I've already gone over, but some of the dis directors discussed to helm the film included Steven Spielberg. He could definitely, I, I think if we're, if we're going to get a Star Wars movie directed by one of these old school directors that, like, worked in the 70s and 80s like Lucas did, I think Spielberg is probably the best bet to deliver something that feels true to Star Wars. Peter Jackson, yeah, I, I could see that. Christopher Nolan, maybe. I, I don't know that he would be quite as good with the... Like, he... he I think he's he focuses... I love Christopher Nolan. I'm one of his biggest fans. I love all of his movies, except... Dunkirk, that's what it's called, but the, the, you know, he's, he's a more down-to-earth kind of, I mean, he took Batman and, and drained a lot of, like, he's, he's not, he doesn't go deep into those kinds of more out there, outlandish kind of things. I would watch, like, I think, um, 
What's his name again? Let's see. Denis Villeneuve. And no, I have not watched Dune. I might at some point. Based on Blade Runner 2049, I think he could do a good job with a Star Wars movie. Maybe not an episode, but yeah. Let's see. Ben Affleck. I'm... I'm un until he has more practice, I'm not that interested in Ben Affleck directing an action movie. Joss Whedon, I don't think he quite has the, the vision. I, I think he did a great job in the MCU. I, I still love both of the first two Avengers movies, but I do think that, yeah, like, like if we're going to do, if we're going to take some, take an act, take a director who's done MCU stuff, I think James Gunn could make an incredible Star Wars movie. Ryan Johnson, who went on to direct episode eight, James Cameron. I mean, if we were talking like 80s James Cameron, maybe, but I don't know if he still has enough of a grasp. But like, yeah, you know, the James Cameron that directed Aliens could also have directed a solid Star Wars movie. Now... This movie marks the first time in Star Wars history where a stormtrooper uses a melee weapon on screen. Spielberg enjoyed the film so much he saw it four times. Despite being two of the main characters of the new trilogy, Ray and Poe never interact with each other on screen throughout the entire movie. In the first Star Wars film, Leia tells Luke he's a little short for a stormtrooper. Mark Hamill is 5'9", the same height as John Boyega, who plays the defecting stormtrooper Finn in this film. So, he was also not the right height to be a stormtrooper. That's, that's, a, like, that's obviously not actually, that's not, that's not why they cast him, that's not why they, but it is a little funny coincidence. That's, that's one of the coincidences of the writing of this movie that I don't mind. Now, Daisy Ridley was frequently caught singing on set, much to the amusement of the cast and crew. She revealed that she once lost a bet to director J.J. Abrams, that she couldn't go a day without singing. Very charming. Now... Right, originally Captain Phasma was going to be a man and played by Benedict Cumberbatch, but the film drew some complaints about the lack of women in the cast, so they made her a woman, thus marking her career character, the first pivotal female member of the Imperial Stormtroopers, in an official live action Star Wars film, which is quite cool. I wish she had more to do, but. I don't know why people freak out about the fact that, you know, originally JJ was one of the role to be male, but it was like, I would, I think it would be a problem if he insisted, no, this should be a, a male character. Like, he strikes me as the kind of person who just thinks, you know, oh, but, you know, straight white dudes, that's the norm. Every, you know, everything else is a. Uh, you know, anything else we have to explain why is... Like, anyway. So... Okay, so the following is a list of actors who are rumored to have auditioned for roles. 
Chloe Grace Moretz, who I do think I think she could definitely have done a good job as as Ray. Cersei Ronan also would have been a good Ray. Zac Efron, I'm guessing Poe. I honestly don't know enough about him. I haven't really. I've, I only know the. I've watched the two Neighbors movies, where he's good. But yeah, Miles Teller. Poe or would he have been Finn? Michael B. Jordan maybe as Finn. That could definitely have worked. Yeah. Okay, and then some. I don't know. Let's see. And Shiwatel Ejiofor and Gary Oldman were rumored for various roles. Maybe Gary Oldman was in, in place of Max von Sydow. But yeah, very talented actors. Lee Pace auditioned for the role of Kylo Ren. I could definitely see that, yeah. There was only one pre-release photo of Donald Gleason in the role of General Hux, and during an interview with Gleason, a writer asked him if Hux was a good guy or a bad guy. Gleason laughed and said, we're all in a lot of trouble if a guy wearing that uniform becomes a good guy, referring to the fact that Hux's military uniform was purposely designed to look like a space version of the Nazi Wehrmacht uniform. Max von Sydow played Emperor Ming, the Merciless, in the film Flash Gordon. The Flash Gordon comic strip and Saturday Morning Serials were one of George Lucas's influences behind the Star Wars franchise. So that is a, a fun kind of... Because he wanted to... He, he had hoped to direct a Flash Gordon live-action film adaptation, which is just like a, a feature film adaptation. I, I, they... Were the serials? I think the serials were live action. Yeah, never mind. That would definitely not have been as effective as like I. I really I'm sometimes I'm really glad when Hollywood is like no you're not gonna get to do that because like George Lucas is like oh man I really wish I could do a Flash Gordon movie and then they said oh okay I guess I'll just create one of the biggest phenomenons in all of science fiction. And, you know, when, like, Sam Raimi originally wanted to do a movie based on The Shadow, and they were like, no, so, okay, I guess I'll create my own character, and he makes Dark Man, which is an incredible movie. Please do not ever ask me to choose between the, the Shadow movie and Dark Man, because those are both two incredible movies. Now, the original runtime of the movie was 2 hours and 40 minutes long before being cut down to 2 hours and 16 minutes only, until only a month before release. Yeah, that's... Honestly, it doesn't really feel like it was... That's a sign of good editing. Originally, Kylo, you know, what what was originally going to, what was originally considered for Kylo's appearance instead provided the blueprint for Captain Phasma, which maybe also helps explain, what, you know, I mean, that is, that is it. She has a cool look. You know, it's not like she does anything in this movie that makes you think, wow, that's an incredible character. You know, she's just, like some people have said, oh, she's like, she's like Boba Fett, you know, she's. Not in that much of the movie, has a cool design, gets killed off in a really unceremonious way, and doesn't actually really do anything. Like, you know, she she tries to get Finn, you know, what was it? Like, she wants him to go through, like, re-education or something, but that's that's it. Like, there's no other... And, and that doesn't, you know, she, she fails to do that, so... I mean, yeah, like, hypothetically, you could easily have given a couple of things she does and says to, to Hux. 
Actually, yeah, now that I think about it, I said in the review that there aren't too many villains. I hadn't thought about how technically Captain Phasma qualifies as one of the antagonists. She's not like the main villain, but she's an antagonist. I think they should have gotten rid of her. I, I don't think there needed to be, like, or at the very least, don't draw attention to the character. Don't give them a cool design, because everybody's going to think that they actually have some kind of... You know, and, and some people have said that it should have been Captain Phasma fighting Finn. You know, that, that one stormtrooper that throws down the... the what were they hoping? Like, a, a, was one of the things they were holding, like, a shield? Since when do stormtroopers have shit? Anyway, it just... I'm not saying there's a problem with changing that. I'm saying when when the stormtrooper throws that away, I'm sitting there thinking, what was that? And that distracts me from the, the fight. I, th I think that, anyway, that should have been Phasma instead of, you know, like, if you know the backstory, like, apparently that's supposed to be someone who worked directly with Finn. And, you know... Yeah, so he feels personally betrayed. They they worked alongside each other, and now Finn is working for the rep resistance. Now, that is absolutely everything that I had to say. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page and one two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested view for watch. On the screen right about now, I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on the movie. And recently, the reviewing thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this one, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoy watching as I enjoy watching and recording. And I will catch you next time.